This video is sponsored by Incogni, a personal information removal service that protects your online data from search sites and data brokers. Use my link in the description to get 60% off Incogni's annual plan. Cynthia had never experienced an emotion in her entire life. At a young age, it was clear that she was very unusual, that her life would be very different. When she was around four years old, Cynthia's parents began noticing weird behaviors. She was often unfazed, non-reactive, and unpredictable. She would cry or laugh at situations that seemed entirely misaligned with what was happening around her, like she was giving a performance, but on the wrong cue. When other children might laugh, Cynthia might cry. When they cried, she might smile. Her parents assumed it was a developmental delay or incongruity that would correct itself over time. That's what teachers and doctors told them, at least. As Cynthia got a bit older and she could communicate more comprehensively, things only became more unclear. When asked why she was doing something or not doing something, her answers were almost always, I don't know, or I thought that's what you were supposed to do. She struggled to connect with her peers and classmates. When her parents or teachers asked if she felt lonely or different, Cynthia seemed to not even understand what they meant. When they pushed a bit further and asked why she wasn't engaging with her classmates, she almost always responded with literal reasons. She would say something like, they're outside right now, I'm inside. Or when they asked why she seemed upset or disinterested, she might say, my stomach hurts, or my head feels weird. Everything reached a turning point when, in third grade art class, Cynthia, along with all the other students, were asked to paint a portrait of themselves in a moment when they felt happiest. All her classmates painted bright, vibrant figures with big smiles and wide eyes, placed in settings like a beach or a baseball field or a fair. Cynthia, however, painted a girl with no facial features at all. It was merely an outline of a figure, painted in seemingly arbitrary dark colors, and the background was empty. When the art teacher saw, at first they assumed it was an act of defiance against the instructions, but when they asked Cynthia if she was going to add anything, she responded with genuine confusion. No, why? She said. Well, what makes you the happiest here? The art teacher asked. Me? Cynthia said in a tone that tried to be a statement, but came off as a question. After the art teacher notified Cynthia's parents about the exchange, her parents could no longer remain passive. Later that year, after consultations with various psychologists and specialists, Cynthia was diagnosed with alexithymia, a condition in which an individual struggles to identify, understand, and express emotions. In Cynthia's case, it was so severe, her neurologist recommended that she undergo a brain scan to ensure there weren't any other more serious complications. When the MRI scans came back, they showed that Cynthia's brain was, structurally, totally normal no signs of damage or underlying abnormalities at all. Later fMRI scans, however, revealed tangibly weak to almost no activity in various regions of her brain, regions generally associated with emotional activity and awareness. The signals that typically painted experience with feeling were functional but largely dormant or not interfacing with the rest of her brain. It was as if the emotional regions of her brain were isolated and set apart, a remote island that could be seen but not reached or communicated with. Is there anything that could be done at all? Cynthia's mother asked the neurologist, her voice strained and trembling. Her eyes were glassy and her cheeks were wet. We're willing to try anything. Cynthia's father looked stoic, staring forward, just like Cynthia. Unfortunately, there aren't any direct treatments for this condition, the neurologist said. There was a brief silence that seemed to plead for hope. That said, the neurologist continued, science and technology are advancing rapidly in this area. We can continue to reassess options as new understandings and approaches emerge. And since Cynthia is so young, it's also possible her brain will adapt more as she develops. Though Cynthia didn't experience an emotional reaction to this information, it troubled her in a literal, rational kind of way. She now knew, as a matter of fact, that she was very different, that she was missing out on something very important. On the drive home from the neurologists, Cynthia stared out her parents' car window watching as the trees rushed by against the backdrop of a bright blue sky and vibrant sun. She wondered if colors felt like anything. She wondered if images and scenes felt like anything. She felt sick to her stomach. For the first time, she wondered if that sick, weird sensation was supposed to be part of something else. Cynthia turned toward the front of the car. What is emotion like for you guys? She asked her parents softly and plainly. Her mother looked at her father, her father glancing back away from the road. Um, they feel like, like sensations in the brain, in the, in the mind, her mother answered clumsily. 
Like a headache? Cynthia asked. Sort of. Sometimes they can, but they can, they can feel like all sorts of things. Often softer, more subtle, more like... Cynthia's mother paused, realizing how hard it was to describe emotions as anything other than themselves. Almost like temperatures and, and textures, Cynthia's father interjected. Some can feel warm, others feel cold, hard or soft, sometimes bright or dark. Hmm. Cynthia murmured as she turned back toward the window. So your brain feels warm and hard and stuff. Sort of, yeah, her mother responded hesitantly. So are you thinking it or feeling it? I don't get it. Kind of both, Cynthia's father responded. What do you feel right now? Cynthia asked. There was a brief silence. Um, I feel sad, her mother answered. Why? Cynthia asked earnestly. Because I, I feel sad for you, honey. You could feel emotions for other people too sometimes. And I, why do you feel sad for me? There was another brief silence. Her mother turned all the way around toward Cynthia. Because you can't, she said, quickly turning around so Cynthia wouldn't see the tears running down her cheek. This moment changed everything for Cynthia. The diagnosis, the conversation, the knowledge that something so important was missing fractured her world completely. She had jumped from one world to another, a world that looked the same, but contained the knowledge that it was entirely incomplete. Cynthia became obsessed with the concept of emotion. She constantly asked her parents, her family members, her teachers, and her classmates what they were feeling and what emotions were like for them. Still in early childhood, Cynthia's naive hope was that in hearing and understanding enough about emotions, she might experience them. Of course, most people happily obliged Cynthia's requests. In fact, many found the exchanges to be deeply invigorating, an opportunity to consciously recognize just how miraculous and ethereal emotions and consciousness are. The problem was, however, Everyone struggled to articulate what their emotional experiences were like. They either needed to use other emotional terminology or analogies. But of course, neither helped Cynthia. Other emotional terms were just concepts she also didn't understand. And saying an emotion felt warm, for example, was like telling a blind person that orange feels warm. If you don't understand the reference, and you touch an orange object, you only discover the temperature of the room. By her teens, Cynthia had begun delving into the philosophy and science of emotion. She read every book and article and watched every video she could find. She soon discovered that a similar issue that occurred when asking individuals what emotion was like for them was occurring in science and philosophy more broadly. The confusion and nebulousness of the topic only further revealed itself in college, when Cynthia studied psychology and learned more about all the existing models, frameworks, and theories around emotion. How they were mostly all contradictory or incomplete, she couldn't believe that humanity was apparently an emotionally driven species that lived and died on feelings, and yet it did not even have a shared complete definition of emotion. One college course in particular changed everything for her. Philosophy of mind. On one of the first weeks of class, Cynthia sat in the front row of the lecture hall. The professor stood at the front with the projector screen behind him. On it was an illustrated profile of a figure staring at a monochrome apple. A thought bubble extended above the figure's head with the colored apple inside it. Qualia, the professor said, pointing at the colored apple inside the thought bubble. Redness, softness, happiness. It is what we call the subjective, first-person experiences of raw physical processes in the brain. The professor changed the slide on the screen to an image of a brain and a neuron. Cynthia watched and listened intently. How on earth does that work, huh? Raw physical events equating to subjective, first-person experiences? Modern philosophers and neuroscientists are quite divided on the matter, as you might imagine. Some believe that this divide between what is happening in the brain and what is felt by the person is a permanent fault line, an untraversable crevasse between knowledge and experience. The professor changed the slide again. This time the screen showed an image of a man and a bat, along with a quote next to the image. The professor read it. If the subjective character of experience is fully comprehensible only from one point of view, then any shift to greater objectivity that is, less attachment to a specific viewpoint, does not take us nearer to the real nature of the phenomenon. It takes us farther away from it. That's a quote from philosopher Thomas Nagel. He argues that knowing all the objective facts about the brain and the experience of a perception would not and could not equate to actually knowing what the perception is like. It inherently leaves something out. The professor changed the slide again, revealing an image of a different man. Other philosophers, he continued, like Daniel Dennett, 
believe we can, or could, know what it's like to experience a particular perception if we had all the facts related to the perception. We would know it fully enough, including its subjective character, to predict or imagine the experience. We could even recreate it. The professor changed the slide again, revealing a black and white illustration of a woman sitting in a room with a computer in front of her and books surrounding her. At the bottom of the image, text read, Mary's room. Cynthia stared up at the screen as the professor's voice faded into a light garble behind her thoughts. Watered by a storm of rumination, of new knowledge and new confusion, her obsession with emotion was blooming now more than ever. This was what she was going to dedicate the rest of her life to. Assisting science in accruing enough knowledge on emotion, on all the facts of the brain, so she could experience them for herself. Cynthia would go on to obtain her PhD in cognitive neuroscience from one of the world's leading programs. During this time, she became increasingly immersed in computational modeling and brain mapping. Following her PhD in the year 2025, she began working for a large NGO focused on developing full-scale, high-resolution brain mapping. Cynthia quickly moved through the organization and obtained the role of Director of Computational Neuroimaging. By the early 2030s, largely as a result of Cynthia's leadership and her work on various algorithms and image processing frameworks, the NGO developed the first brain scan technology with neural resolution at the level of individual synapses with less than a millisecond of latency. An unbelievable breakthrough. In both human brains and digital simulations, Cynthia could now see every detail, component, and pattern of every known emotion. She could build them up and break them down from their total bodily form to their minute neural components. In 2035, Cynthia published a book, The Grand Theory of Emotion. It was the culmination of her entire life's work, a unifying theory of emotion that melded biology and computation. Almost overnight, she went from being a leading researcher in a developing area of science to a major public figure. She was asked to host events and lectures, she appeared on massive mainstream podcasts and shows, and she sold millions of copies of her book. Her story was unbelievable. Without reportedly having ever experienced an emotion in her entire life, she was the expert on emotion. She knew everything there was to know. The physics of it, the processes by which different events stimulate the brain, how these triggers create different neural patterns, the exact framework and nature of these patterns, and how consciousness interprets and experiences the neural activity in the form of concepts and feelings. Of course, Cynthia and her work didn't go without criticism. Many scientists and philosophers debated the completeness of her theory. Some argued that if she truly knew all the facts about emotion, then she must also know how her own brain would respond subjectively. In other words, she must have known what emotions were like. Or at least, in principle, she should have been able to imagine or simulate the experience of them. But Cynthia claimed she couldn't. She claimed that there was still something left for her to learn. Not long after publishing her work, Cynthia was recruited by one of the world's leading neurotech companies, Pelios. It branded itself as engineering human feeling. At the time, its primary focus was on developing, producing, and commercializing emotion-regulating brain-computer interfaces for the mainstream consumer market, a device that could register, regulate, and produce emotions. They were still missing crucial components for the system to work, however, components that Cynthia's work provided. Once on board as Director of Neural Systems Architecture, Cynthia helped Helios fully integrate real-time mapping of both the brain and body. Thanks to her, soon, the device worked. It could produce precise, complete emotional experiences. Cynthia was given the opportunity to be the first to try it. She accepted. On June 1, 2042, she underwent the brief implant procedure. Then she put on a set of small wearable sensors. Sitting in the Pelio's lab, she faced out at her colleagues. They all understood what this moment meant. A lifelong journey toward understanding every facet of emotion about to be complete. Are you ready? The Pelio CEO asked Cynthia, prepared to flip the toggle of the device on and trigger the emotion Cynthia had selected. Cynthia looked over at him, then she looked at everyone else. Yes, she replied, staring forward. The CEO flipped the toggle on, then he pressed the button reading, Run Joy. A moment passed. Every eye in the room widened, every breath shallowed. Cynthia stayed steady, her face and body unmoving. Then, she looked over at the CEO and said, It's running? Yes, the CEO replied with a bit of unease. For a moment, 
Cynthia looked confused. The crowd began to as well. Then, Cynthia smiled. Whether information can ever truly bridge the gap between objective knowledge and subjective experience remains a vitally profound debate. But one thing information can certainly do is expose who you are. And in the wrong hands, that information can be exploited for profit, manipulation, or worse. That is, unless you use this video's sponsor, Incogni. Imagine an individual named Daryl. His personal information, like his full name, home address, login credentials, and social security number, is freely floating around online across countless data brokers and people search sites. Eventually, this leads to Daryl dealing with identity theft and harassment. Even after finally resolving these crises, Daryl is still left with unending spam that floods his email and phone, along with a looming sense of vulnerability. Now imagine another individual named Liam. Liam uses Incogni, a service that works on your behalf to remove your personal information from those same sites. All Liam had to do was go through a quick, simple sign-up process, grant Incogni permission to work on his behalf, and now his online information is continually controlled and contained, with removal of it always happening automatically in the background of his life. Better yet, with Incogni's unlimited plan, Liam can also provide the links for any additional sites he specifically wants addressed, and Incogni's privacy specialists will handle removal requests an unlimited number of times. Legally, these sites must remove your information if it's requested, and Incogni ensures they do. If you'd rather live more protected and private and far less vulnerable, you can start today. By clicking my link in the description or going to incogni.com slash pursuit of wonder, you'll get 60% off Incogni's annual plan. And of course, as always, thank you so much for watching in general, and see you next video.